live an honorable life. How many of you have heard that in some form or fashion? But the question is, how do we do that? And for me, it brings me to a trip that I used to take each and every year, 12 hours south to visit my grandparents. And each time I would get there, my grandfather would take his wrinkly finger and he'd point to this picture that he had mounted back in 1943. It looked like this, and it read, 200 ships for victory. He worked in the Los Angeles shipyards where they made the Liberty ships, those ships that supplied the lifeblood for our allied forces in the Pacific and the Atlantic. And for him, he was so proud about it. You looked in his eye and you thought it was just yesterday, but it was 50 years later. He said, look at that, Richard. I built that. And in the 1940s, when he brought his eight-year-old daughter, my mom, to the shipyards, it was family day, he said, this is what mom says, look at these big sheets of metal. They were about twice the size of this red carpet. I transform them, I bolt them, I weld them, and I turn them into these big guns that sit in the front of these Liberty ships. It's the only way they defend themselves as they're out in the free ocean. And so there he was describing to her, my mother, this amazing ship and what he had done. Very, very proud. And that translated also as it moved forward to my mother. Because as she took that sense of what it meant to be proud, what my grandfather did was he was so proud that what it meant for his children, three of them enlisted into the Army and into the Navy. And you could see the pictures of, of them on the mantle as you walked in years later, them in their uniform when they had first enlisted. You couldn't miss it. While they were in the field, my mom was at home. She was the youngest daughter, so that meant that she had to cook all the breakfasts and the lunches and the dinners. She worked 12 hours in the corner store. And then she would go to school in between. At midnight, when she had her own time finally, that's when she would study. And she'd do that day after day after day. My mother, her sense of service and honor to her family continues to this day now that she takes care of my father, who suffers from Alzheimer's. And she is now taking on a second career, full-time, new title, not school teacher anymore. It reads family caregiver, 40 hours, 100 hours of overtime. Sorry, you don't get any fringe benefits and no salary. Yet she continues. And in fact, it's so difficult her job, emotionally and physically, that it's more likely now that she will die taking care of her sick husband. Yet for my mother, that doesn't stop her. She continues. And what's great is today we have more information about how this does happen, right? And it's not always positive. One of those pieces of information comes from the Alzheimer's Association. And that is one out of three people that are born today will get Alzheimer's or a dementia-related disease. We used to think, oh, dad's just a little crazy. Now we know Alzheimer's kills a lot of people in the United States, the sixth largest killer in the United States. And so for my mother, as we look forward and I look at her service, it also reminds me of another amazing couple I got to interview last year. It was Jason and Alexis Cornyn. Jason and Alexis Cornyn are a military family. And Alexis was part of the U.S. Armed Forces. And she was on duty one day, and what happened was a crane got loose. It struck her in the head tragically. And she was injured so severely in her spine as well as other places that she was no longer able to talk or walk in the way she was before. So Jason and their two young daughters all of a sudden had a new role too. They became military caregivers. But we don't hear about them. There are over five million military caregivers today. And because they're so hidden, the Dole Foundation said, we're gonna start a Hidden Heroes campaign. And these hidden heroes, all more than five million of them, are different in one way. Most of them are in their 20s and 30s. So they have over 50 years of family caregiving ahead of them. And that's what makes them so courageous. They, these five million, are part of an even bigger group. 
If you can imagine the number of unpaid family caregivers and along with these um, awesome hidden heroes, all counted, including you and this audience here, over 40 million according to AARP. I joined those ranks about a year and a half ago. I went to my very kind employers and I said, my father has Alzheimer's, I'd like to work part time. And they said yes. Now, I don't, there's not a lot of folks that are news anchors that work part time, by the way. And, and it doesn't make a lot of sense if you're a person that likes to be on TV to say, hey, can you put me on TV less? Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot like a, a surgeon. To be a better surgeon, you need to operate fewer times. Um, and so when I think about it, though, doing less and earning less is actually more. And part of that more for me, when I have to describe it to people, is what I do is I take care of my dad. But then there's the reaction sometimes. Wait, isn't that a woman's job? Uh, sh shouldn't your sister be doing that? No. And in fact, the reality is this. Four out of ten family caregivers are men. But I just don't know how to talk about it. When I'm asked, I say, I take care of my dad. What should I say? I'm a male caregiver. That's what I should say. And then maybe we'll have five out of ten that are male caregivers. <laughs> Finally, gender parity. <laughs> the issue is, though, this is an unpaid job. And when you count up all the hours, whether you're a man or a woman or anything in between, is that these are a lot of hours that are spent that don't get paid. The number, guess what it is? $470 billion unpaid. Half a trillion bucks. So I calculated, like, what is that like? Just to put my arms around what it is. 17 states for an entire year. Every single worker from Alaska up to Vermont and Maine working for free for a year. That's how much it's worth, these unpaid family caregivers. So to keep that number low in my family, in terms of the hours we're putting out, we've pulled in a lot of technology. We're kind of like the Louis MacGyvers, uh, is what we like to call ourselves. <laughs> the issue is, you know, when we look at the technology, uh, it, we're talking about 2016 MacGyver, by the way, not the old MacGyver. Um, <laughs> Google that. Uh, speaking of Google, though, we do use Google Docs, a lot of shared documents. We've got a log that we put in, like when I'm there. What did Dad say? What did he eat? You know, did he fall? Uh, what's his mood today? How's Mom? What's the, what were the things that I fixed in the house? We also have web-streamed video in all the different rooms, two-way audio, digital locks that we can change remotely. We've got a, an amazing doorbell that can sense when my dad opens the door and it goes a different sound, so we know that he's doing that. And when I think about it, maybe we're not like MacGyvers, maybe we're McCaregivers. <laughs> All we need is a drone, I think. You know, zzz, psh, there's the medicine, zzz, psh, there's your lunch, fried chicken, way to go. What I also do, though, is I have to fly across the country. And in that time that I've been given, thanks to my job, as you know, I'm in New York, so on Mondays when I'm not working, I work over the weekend, I get in a plane to get that 10-hour trip door to door, fly to San Francisco, land in the evening, work for about three or four days, and then get in a plane and do 10 hours door to door back to New York. I flew the equivalent last year of 12 times around the world, 300,000 miles, the most I've ever done. And that actually isn't the most difficult, I believe. It's actually the day-to-day -day with my father. When I was back home, you know, the, the typical process is my dad at 8 p.m., he's trying to get outside of the door. But he can't because we've locked it and reversed the, 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 the locks. And so then he goes to the windows and tries to climb onto those, and he, he can't do that either because we locked them. So I take him back to his bedroom. I say, you can't get to your old bed that you le you've lived in for 50 years. You have a new bed that you've now been sleeping in six months, but he doesn't remember. So we put him to bed. Five minutes later, he gets up, goes to the bathroom, comes out and says, breakfast time. No, it's 9 p.m. Take him back, go to sleep. Five minutes later, we turn off the, the light, walk away, gets up, zzz, bathroom, breakfast time. And we do that 30 times every night until about 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. 
So that's why we need 24-hour monitoring now. But think about this. This is my dad going to sleep 30 times a night and then getting up. I don't know how cranky y'all get, but if, if I'm getting up more than three times every night, I'm pretty cranky. But when we put him to sleep, he is so joyous. In fact, he squeals because he loves being put to bed. We put him to bed, he's like, ee! I love this. And he loves it because he remembers that beauty of being tucked into bed, right? The light being turned off, blankets being put in. And if you're keeping count, that's 30 squeals at least, <laughs> every night. This is all part of what's related to what we call ADLs in the business, right? The activities of daily living. I call it the pooping and eating stuff. Uh, my dad poops in different ways than he ever did before. He also eats in different ways. He likes toothpaste now. Um, by the cup loads. Um, and in addition to that, you know, he likes to streak. <laughs> it's kind of funny sometimes. Uh, 83-year-old man, a pastor. Uh, he loves everything I cook for him now. He laughs at all my jokes. He says, Jesus says if you eat cookies, you get skinny. <laughs> he tells me he loves me every 30 minutes because he forgets. And then he hugs me every 30 minutes too, sometimes with his pants off. <laughs> Imagine that. So my father and I are closer in many different ways than we have <laughs> ever been before. But you know that closeness is difficult sometimes too. I tell my friends, it's like watching my father die in front of me. And there are some times where it's overwhelming. There are some times where I'm sad, like a big wet blanket, and I just, it's down on my bone, and I don't know what to do. But then I remember what he taught me how to be and how to fight. And it was like when I was this tall, I came home, he's not being bullied, and he says there's two options here. You continue to be bullied or you fight back and defend yourself. So let's defend myself. And so began five great years of being trained by a former Shaolin Temple Kung Fu master. <laughs> I thought he was like Bruce Lee. I thought it was like Bruce Lee after being trained by him. You know, because he gave me the strength. I was looking people in the eye and saying, okay, I'm ready to fight you. So I had the confidence at least. And besides, who would want to fight a four-foot mini Bruce Lee, freshly minted by a legit former Shaolin Temple Kung Fu master? I mean, I, was, I even looked like him. It's a little smaller, that's all. <laughs> but that ability to fight back is what he taught me. So as my dad today struggles and fights against Alzheimer's, I am still that nine-year-old kid. I know how to fight, and now what I do is I fight for him. So when he wants to have that chocolate donut, that he forgets where the donut shop is at, I go with him. When he wants his favorite tuna fish sandwich, but he doesn't know what to call it anymore, I go and get it with him. And it's difficult for him to go on walks. People take advantage of him. They try to take money from him. They push him over. But I am that still nine-year-old kid and I'm fighting for him, I am there for him, and that's what I try to do based on what he taught me when I was this tall. As a child, he taught me. As a child, he is now. I take care of him. And that's the opportunity. The opportunity for my father, for my mother, for my siblings, and for me, and that is to be committed, to be faithful, and as my grandfather said, to live honorably and to learn to learn that my father was once a very scared young father who was now an always joyous man. And to learn that I'm not watching necessarily him die in front of me, but instead that I'm perhaps through his sickness watching him be reborn. <laughs>